Let's sing together. It's in my way, it hurt my cry. It's in my morning in the shadow. It's all we last for a time. With the light I can see. How are you all today? Excellent. I'm glad you're here. We're excited you're here and hope that you just experience uh, the Northbridge today just in a positive way and you experience God in the way that you need to experience Him and worship Him in the way that you need to worship Him today. Outside in the cafe area, as always, there's some lovely ladies that keep that coffee fresh and fresh donuts and bagels and water. Feel free to grab yourself uh, an extra cup of coffee or a bagel donut. Bring it in here and again, just experience God uh, the way you need to experience uh, Him today. Uh, when you came in, hopefully you received a little handout that looks just like this. Uh, inside that handout is a connection card. And if you're visiting with us, we'd love to know you're with us today. So take a moment, fill that out. Uh, on your way out the garage door there, there's a little wood box in our giving center. You can drop that in there. Uh, and or you can uh, put it over in a little basket over in our, giving, in our uh, guest services area. It's just our way of wanting to connect with you, of wanting just to encourage you and say thank you uh, for being with us today. If there's any way that we can serve you or pray for you or, or anything that we can uh, offer you, also note that on there as well. We'll connect with you uh, in the way that we need to. Uh, one announcement I want to make you aware of is inside your, your handout, uh, if I say gift uh, for foster kids, a lot of people understand what that means and they get kind of excited about that. Uh, that is coming up next week. We'll be starting that for those of you who are new and kind of want to know what that's about. Uh, we at Northbridge take great pride in helping our foster families out around here. And we're going to have an opportunity to connect with and adopt uh, a foster kid over the next uh, couple of weeks and help them out with Christmas. And so if that's something that you are interested in, be praying about that. You'll have an opportunity to sign up for that next week. Uh, we'll have a, a, a hundred plus kids 
that we will be asking you to help and asking you to pray about helping. And I'm going to tell you that that sounds like a lot of kids, but when we open up that sign-up table, it seems to go very quick. So be praying about that. And if you want to grab a kid, be prepared to do that in the next couple of weeks. We're not asking you to to spend $100 on these kids, but we're, we'll give you a wish list of some things that they would like to have. And we're asking you to pray about just maybe a $25 or $30 a gift that you can offer to help that foster family out to make that uh, child have uh, a better Christmas. And so be praying about that. Uh, it's one thing that we need to make sure you're aware of. Hey, we got a special announcement just real quick, don't we, before we go into our meet and greet? We sure do. Um, my grandparents are down celebrating their 55th wedding anniversary. They're right there. Would you stand up? There we go. Congratulations. So as you guys head to your time of just kind of meeting somebody and greeting somebody, say congratulations to them. Let's sing together. The cross before me, the world behind, I'm turning back. There's a better high, it's not for us, it's all for you. Let the heavens shake and split the sky, let the people cry. Oh, 
this morning, so I invite you to uh, join us as you learn.
And uh, right now, we're going to just go before God uh, and live in that truth. We're going to pray to Him in that truth. And so I invite you to join, whether you're on the iCampus or right here, right now. One of the things I would ask is this. I, I'd ask you, I'm not going to force you to do anything or, you know, manipulate you. But whatever position you were in during that song, I'd, I'd ask that you change up your position. Uh, maybe you're just standing here. I'd ask that you consider maybe bowing your head and, and folding your hands. Uh, maybe you had your hands folded. I'd ask maybe you think about putting your hands up here just in surrender to God. And maybe for some of you, if you're physically able, you're going to just just use your, uh, use your uh, uh, chair as a prayer bench and kneel down. I would invite you to do that. Let's just change up our position, how we've been standing, uh, knowing that we're talking to the Holy First. Maybe if you've been standing, just be seated right now. And let's pray to God. And Father, we stand before you. We stand before you. Having sung, your love never fails. It never gives up. It will never run out on us, Father. And uh, Lord, no doubt there's someone in this room that desperately needed to be reminded of that truth today. And so we come before you, God. We don't have our acts together. We're not perfect. We, uh, we are seekers, daily seeking your grace, daily seeking your presence and your touch. And we know many of us, Father, we, we've experienced that through the, the work of your son, Jesus Christ. And he's in our lives, and we thank you for the freedom that we have in that. Uh, but God, we confess that with Jesus in our lives, sometimes we struggle. And sometimes we just need to be reminded afresh of your grace. And your mercy is made new every day, your word declares to us. And so we lean into that hard and deep right now, Father. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' strong and powerful name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. I welcome you here as well. Uh, so the... Uh, the experience, as I think through this, I think of Jesus' last few days uh, as he gathered his disciples just literally the night before he was, he was convicted. Uh, he, he gathers his disciples into a, a small enclosed room and, and he's teaching them some very deep truths about him, about the kingdom of God. And it's blowing the disciples' minds. And one of the things that Jesus finally reveals to them is he's saying, guys, uh, today I am leaving you. I'm leaving you today. And I could imagine how rocked the disciples felt at that moment. I could imagine just their consternation. I could imagine the emotional upheaval of what was happening that whole week. One minute, these, these guys, all they put their entire life into the hopes of Jesus. They, they staked themselves there. And one minute as they're traveling around Jerusalem on that holy week, they're feeling like, this is it. This is the day he's going to be installed as the king. He is coming. He's going to throw Rome out. We are going to rule with Jesus. And the prophets that have been around and the prophecies that have been around for hundreds of years, we're going to get to live out. And then just moments later, from that high, coming down to the low, low of hearing rumor of possible arrest and conviction and, and crucifixion, and I could just imagine all the turmoil going on in the disciples' lives as they're hearing Jesus' words. And, and specifically when Jesus is saying, hey guys, those rumors you're hearing, uh, they're true. They're true. It's tonight that I'm, I'm going away from you. I have to go away from you. I could imagine, I could only imagine what the disciples felt at that moment. And it was in the midst of that that Jesus goes on to say, he says in, in, in John 16 verse 7, Jesus says, I truly tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands Condemned. And then he goes on in verse 13, says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. 
He will not speak on his own. He will not... He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is for me that he will receive what he will make known to you. And so Jesus teaches and has an extended time teaching about who is the Holy Spirit. And we began this series last week with Pastor Mike. And I just tell you up front, I'm, you, you normally used to seeing a table here. You normally used to seeing a different setup. Uh, one of the things, I've just changed up my style for today uh, and how I'm teaching. I'm going off of a script uh, format. And so for like people like my wife, uh, you're saying praise the Lord because there's less things you're going to probably have to uh, apologize for down the road if you go off of a script and you, you've thought through these things and you've honed it and, uh, and, and you know what you're going to say versus just you know having typically I have a note card with three or four points and I know the points I'm going to make and then kind of the stories and the stuff comes you know point of mind and so there's a lot of times I have to apologize later and go wow I need to walk that one back but, but you know I don't want to do that today because when we're talking about the Holy One of Israel you can't apologize you, you can't go, wow, I really misspoke there. God, I'm sorry about that. I mean, I mean you can. You can. I mean, he's, uh, just what we said, his love never runs out. You know, he's got grace. But I don't want to, okay? I don't want to have to say, wow, God, I really blew that one when I was trying to describe you to people that came here to learn about you today. You know, it's one thing to maybe mess up about a parenting technique. You can walk that back easy. But when you walk, you can't, it's just hard to walk back a, a telling a misstatement about the Holy One of Israel about the creator God of the universe. And so I just thought the best way for us is just for me to work through my thoughts and just put them down on paper and, uh, and, and just stay on script, you know, and just, just know that the teaching here has been thought about and prayed over for the last week. I, every teaching, well, whoever the teacher is, that's, we can say that confidently, but, uh, but I also just put them on paper. So you know, the reason I say that is if you're new and you're guest, and you, this isn't a normal style of teaching for me, and if you've been around... For a while, you know, and you're like, I don't know if I like that so much. That's the reason why. Uh, chances are you're probably at the end going, yeah, you need to teach like that from now on. So I don't know that that would be good for me either, but, but that's what we're going to do. Last week, we uh, started this series uh, in which we're looking at the person of the Holy Spirit. We're calling the series Comforter because that's one of the names of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Pastor Mike did a wonderful job, did a great job uh, helping us identify some important questions about the Spirit in his talk last week. If you remember, he, he asked the question, who is he? Uh, he asked the question, where does the Spirit reside? Uh, he asked the question, what does the Spirit do? And, and a fourth question that I think is just the most critical question of all was, how does the Holy Spirit work in you and me? Those are four very important questions that we need to wrestle with and we need to own as individual believers and followers of Christ. Uh, they are critical for our answers in our lives. And, and here's the cool thing. The next five weeks, we're going to spend time delving deeper into all those questions that Pastor Mike uh, asked. Okay, Pastor Mike mentioned those questions and gave us snippets on each of those. He you know, gave some small answers, some very, very tight answers on all those questions. And then what we're going to do is now the next five weeks, just take each of those questions and go deeper into them. And, and here's, here's what our hope is. And only, the only way this can happen is through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Our, our prayer is that every person, no matter who you are, you're going to get something out of this. So it might be that you've been a Christ follower, uh, you know, uh, for the last 500 years. You know, you, you don't need to be talking about or no one needs to preach to you about Noah's Ark because you were there when Noah's Ark happened, right? And, you know, or, or you were like me and you grew up with the flannel graphs for vacation Bible school. And I know what Noah looks like because I've seen it on Velcro, you know. I, I know all that stuff. And, and so it might be that you're like that. And my hope is that you're going to be challenged and you're going to, uh, some things are going to be shared that are just kind of deep for you that you're going to be able to wrestle with. And having said that, I also get that there are a lot of folks that come here and gather with us regularly who, man, you haven't, you've never read your Bible. You've never opened up a Bible. You know, you were given a, a book walking across the street one day by a guy named Gideon and, and it's sitting there collecting dust and you don't have a clue what Ezra is or, or, or Luke or, or second hesitations is. You know, you don't, you know, you don't care about any of that. Um, and for you, my hope is that you're challenged in some way. 
Uh, as we are talking about the person of the Holy Spirit and that you don't walk away from this going, wow, this stuff is just beyond me. I don't know why these crazy people are asking these crazy questions. I have no desire uh, to, to, to go there. You know, but my, my, my thought is that, yes, you do. You should. There, there are some things here for you. And, and so today, as we deal with these critical questions, I am tasked with speaking the first question and answering the first question, who is he? Who is he? Now, see, in the 1970s, in the early 80s, there was a movie that came out, a series of movies, actually, that came out that really redefined culture. It redefined the art of movie making. It, it, it changed our, our culture very much. And if you were a child of the 70s or the 80s uh, and you were a nerd, chances are you know the movie or the series, the franchise I'm talking about. So on the count of three, let's just all say it together so that I know that I'm not the only one in the room. Okay? One, two, three, Star Wars. Very good. I was going to be scared if someone said St. Elmo's Fire or something like that. You know, uh, Star Wars. And in Star Wars, people think the lead character was was Luke Skywalker, and then some of their more esoteric will say, oh, no, it was about Darth Vader and about his salvation. But I subscribe to you that the real uh, main character in the movie was the Force. And the Force was described, uh, back in that day in American culture, uh, Buddhism and Hinduism and the Eastern sects of religion and stuff was kind of starting to creep into our culture. And so uh, George Lucas says that he got some of his inspiration from Hinduism and Buddhism. And, and so he described and he wrote about this all-powerful force that lived and existed throughout all the universe. And, how you could tap into it. You know, you, you could, uh, if you had the gift, you could tap into the force. And, and, and the force was there to be used for good or for evil. It, it, he, the force had no will of its own. You know, it was just there, just this power. And I can't tell you how many pastors and how many youth pastors specifically I encountered uh, as a kid in the 80s, in the early 90s, in which they'd get this bright idea of trying to make God relevant. You know, and they would say, hey, guys, the Holy Spirit is like the force. It's all powerful. And it's all there just waiting for you to tap into it. Right. And I, I look at that now and I sat there, you know, snot nosed kid, 15 years old. going, Oh, uh -huh, OK. Yeah, that's cool. Hey, that's cool. George Lucas must be a Christian. I'm going to start going to the church that George Lucas goes to. You know, I, 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 and, and one of the things I realized now looking back is how wrong those youth pastors were. That was incredibly poor theology. And I hope that those youth pastors got a little bit of sense over the next 20, 25 years, and they've repented of their heresy that they were teaching us. Because the force has nothing to do with the Spirit of God. You see, because first of all, the Holy Spirit of God is a person. It's not just some imminent force out there that has no emotions and no will and it doesn't matter whether it's being used for good or evil the 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 spirit of god is a person as it's revealed in scripture as he's revealed in scripture so therefore we can conclude that the scriptures attest that he has intellect and emotions and a will the scripture attests to the spirit speaking and testifying and leading god's people the spirit gives commands and guides the body of christ Acts 20 records that even the Spirit will even actually appoint leadership for His church. So now, we're in a great place, and we've been in a great place for a long, long time at Northbridge Church. The pessimist will say, the pessimist in me will say, so when's that shoe going to drop, right? Well, if that shoe ever dropped and I was running scared for my job, I'd point out Acts 20 and say, hey guys, when you're attacking your leadership, uh, keep in mind the Holy Spirit appoints the leadership of the church. So are you attacking the Holy Spirit at times with some barbs at her pastors and her leaders? Something to think about. Uh, but we're in an awesome place now, so I don't need to throw that one at you. Um, so the Spirit being a person, one of the things I've learned about people is it's very easy to offend people. And so you can offend the Holy Spirit of God, too. Do you realize that? I mean, again, going through Scripture, Acts chapter 5 records a family who comes before the church and they lie to the Holy Spirit and they pay a very terrible consequence. 
uh, for it. So it's possible for you to lie to the Spirit. It's also possible for you, Hebrews 10 warns that we might insult the Spirit. Those are the words of Hebrews 10 with poor attitudes. If we come and approach God, we claim to be children of God and we have terrible attitudes, attitudes of the old world, attitudes of the flesh that can insult the spirit. Uh, the scriptures attest, Jesus warns uh, seekers that it's possible to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And, and, and that would be a point of, that would result in just damnation. There, by blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we can grieve. Christians can grieve the Holy Spirit and quench the Spirit's work in our lives according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Uh, it's possible to quench the work of the Spirit in your life and in your church based on actions you take and attitudes you hold. And that's a fearful thing for us to think about, that we can offend the Spirit and, and, and the Spirit's the last person I want to offend. I mean... Golly, I I don't mind offending Brandon Ward there. I'll offend Brandon. You know, we'll get over it. He'll get over it and move on. You know, life goes on. But I don't want to offend the Holy Spirit. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want to insult the Holy Spirit in my life uh, for the consequences that it could uh, pretend for me and also the consequences for the, the body, uh, the larger body at hand. So the Spirit is a person, but we also see that more than just being a person... Uh, you know, the Spirit's not on the same plane as angels or demons or, or spirits or anything like that. The, we also see the Scripture clearly, clearly states that the Holy Spirit is God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Uh, the Trinity. Now, Pastor Mike talked about the Trinity last week. Did a wonderful job teaching on the Trinity. I don't feel a need to teach on that. Uh, today, I don't feel like that's part of my responsibility. I can tell you it's a big, that's a big theology there. How can, how can one God be three and three be one? How does that work? I can't get my hands around it totally. All I know is that's also further proof that our faith is a real deal because if you choose to create a faith, if you choose to make up a religion or a philosophy, you have to be able and you will usually build something that makes sense to you, something you can get your arms around. Uh, but when you develop something, when something's developed that is above you and you can't understand every piece of it, uh, that's a sign that there's something higher than you that's creating this thing. So for me, I just take comfort in knowing that I'm not going to know and I'm not going to understand everything about God because God's mind is quite a bit higher than my God, mind. Uh, God's thoughts is quite a bit higher than my thoughts. And, and so I'm okay knowing that I'm, 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 I'm just lower and I'm not going to... Get everything here. Uh, but since the Holy Spirit is God, we can count on that all the attributes of God the Father and God the Son are also attributes of God the Holy Spirit. He is eternal. He is all-powerful. He is all-present. He's all-knowing. Uh, you know, one of the things that helps me as I think about uh, God uh, the Holy Spirit is we understand uh, a little bit more about Him based on the tasks that He's assigned in Scripture. And, and as you go through Scripture, you discover two primary tasks that God the Father and God the Son assigned God the Spirit. And that was the first one we go into the very beginning, Genesis 1 and 2. And, and, and it records that the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters. Hovered. That was His task. That was His job. He hovered. Now, you and I could sit back and we're scratching our heads going, now what exactly does that mean? Because, you know, I've had that role a few times. I've been able to hover over some things. You know, for instance, uh, Thanksgiving comes, Tony Turner has a task of hovering over the meal table, right? I hover over the people that are cooking the food, and I just, that's my role for, you know, seven, eight hours, just to hover in the kitchen, right? And, and so, but what, what does it mean to hover over the waters to you and I, and I don't, can't tell you how many times I read that, and I just thought, well, it's just a statement. It's just saying that the Spirit was present, and there you go, that's it. And one of the things of last week or so as I was preparing for this talk and thinking about this, I recognized that I just did not fully understand the gravity of that verse and what it uh, owes to us, what, it, what it's trying to communicate. And so one of the things I did was I reached out to some people that I built relationships with long ago. Uh, they live far, far away from here. And I, I still connect with them. A couple of people uh, that are rabbis. 
that uh, understand the Torah, understand the Old Testament in a different mindset than I do because they've had some different training and they just they come from it. They come at it from an approach that uh, you know you know they don't look at the New Testament as inspired Word of God. I recognize that, but when I'm looking for commentary on the Old Testament to help me understand what would a Jew from the first century be thinking when they're reading that, you know, I, I go into those people and ask that question and I get some good insight. And so I emailed that question and said, "Hey, what exactly? How do you guys look at?" This Holy Spirit hovering over the creation. And uh, one of the things that, that really was interesting that they shared with me was that it wasn't just, that was not just a, considered a place where the Holy Spirit was, was residing, but it was actually a, a commentary. It was kind of shorthand. The word hover was shorthand for the idea that, the manifest, that what the Spirit was doing was manifesting God's immediate presence in creation. Wow, that's a mouthful and that's a mindful if you think about it. Because what God was doing was he was, he was not just saying, hey, I'm phoning in creation. Hey, I'm throwing this over here and it's just kind of who you are. And, you know, and this creation is just outside here and I'm just kind of doing this on the side because I've got all these other projects I'm doing as well. But literally what God was communicating to us by telling us that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the water during creation was saying that God is just not over creation but he's present within creation as well. And that's the reason why creation is a holy act. Because it's not just something that God did, but God was there through and through. And since he's holy, the very things he touches, the very thoughts he has, becomes holy by default also. And so we see the Spirit, which is manifesting God's presence throughout all of creation. But a second thing that the Spirit was tasked with doing was redemption. The Holy Spirit was clearly sent to apply the work of Jesus into our lives. This is done uh, in several fold here. It's done by giving us a new spiritual life. We call that regeneration. You know, if you're looking for a theological term, giving us new life. Uh, the Spirit empowers us for service. Uh, we refer by proof texts going back to John 16. Uh, if you go back there, you see what, what the passage we just read was showing about how the Spirit is there to empower, to give us the words to say, to give us the ability to do the deeds that Christ requires of us. So He empowers us. Now, one of the things, too, to understand, because, because this was, this is a default, and I recognize it's something where my Hebrew friends, my Jewish friends, and I would... Uh, thoroughly disagree on, uh, was, you know, they clearly denied that Jesus was, uh, was the Messiah. They clearly denied the, the, my, the friends that I connected with. Uh, clearly, they don't see him as being a part of the Trinity. They just see, say God is one. So, so they, you know, they, they don't understand this whole nuance of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so some people, by default, will say the Holy Spirit has come in the New Testament. He was nowhere around in the Old Testament, is what some people think. Well, I just talked about creation there, but you look throughout all of, all of the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is there working. Numbers 11 talks about two men, one named Eldad, one, one named Medad, or Medad, um, and they were members of the Israelite community, and the scripture attests to how God's Spirit came upon them, and they began to prophesy, or they began to declare the words of God to the people of Israel, declare the words of truth, of words of life, the truth of God to the people of Israel. Uh, numbers 24 talks about, uh, so during this time in Numbers, that's when the people of Israel were going out throughout Palestine, throughout the Mideast, and they were taking, reclaiming the land that God had promised to them, and all these different nations were being dispossessed of their land. So the scriptures talk about how at one point there is this group of kings that come together, they get the hot shot preacher guy to come in, this guy that was evidently, Balaam was his name, evidently he was a superstar in that community. It was thought that Balaam had some real power. He evidently was a pagan priest or a pagan prophet of some kind, did not claim to know God, but evidently he had spiritual authority in the lives of the people that were the pagans. And so they said this, they said, Balaam, we need you to come. We're going to pay you handsomely. You're going to stand on a mountain overlooking the people of Israel and you in front of all of our kings, in front of all of our leaders, in front of our, our army, you're going to declare a curse upon Israel. Now, those of you that are kind of like, I kind of vaguely remember the story. This is the Balaam's donkey story, you know, where the donkey talks. Remember that? That, that story where you're scratching your head? Well, uh, 
so the scripture says that Balaam agreed. He goes up to the, to the mountain. He is fully prepared to utter a curse. Now the curse, the reason for that was twofold. First of all, the people believed it. The people believed that Balaam had all this spiritual authority. And so if he says that they're going to be doomed, they're going to be doomed. So they were really wanting that. But evidently a second thing they were wanting to do was they wanted to do this in the, in the, uh, for the, all the people to see so that it would give their armies, it would give their armies some courage. It would give them hope of, hey, Balaam's against them. If Balaam's against them, I want to be on the same side with Balaam. Well, the craziest thing, thing that still messes with my theology is that in Numbers 24, this pagan high priest, this pagan prophet did not know God. The Holy Spirit invaded him. I, I don't understand it. I, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense with my theology. I'll, all I can tell you is what the Scripture said in Numbers and so this guy comes in fully prepared to utter a curse on God's people, and instead he blesses them. He blesses them, and the scriptures attest it's not because of Balaam's wisdom, it's not because of who he, it's not an utterance from him, it's from the Holy Spirit coming upon him and doing a work within uh, Balaam's life. Let us not forget how the Spirit would put his hand on the judges of Israel, Othniel, Gideon, Samson were leaders uh, who in the book of Judges emphatically states that God's Spirit set them apart to lead and, and that His Spirit would be upon them. And it was evident by their exploits. I mean, there's no doubt that God was present in these people. It was no doubt that His Spirit set these judges apart in order to rout enemies, in order to lead the obstinate people, in order to perform incredible feats of strength. And then we see as, as Israel goes into the time of the kings, we see how the Spirit works and interacts with the kings of Israel. Uh, the Spirit was upon the kings. Clearly, 1 Samuel of chapter 11 records how the Spirit came upon King Saul and he was led to conduct a daring raid in order to save the citizens of Jabesh Gilead. Uh, David understood the Spirit and knew that that was that was something different that he had that no one else had in leadership. Because uh, in Psalm 51, verse 11, he says to them, he writes, Do not cast me from your presence. He's talking to God here. Do not cast me from your presence, God, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Evidently, uh, from what we can tell in the Old Testament, the Spirit had a credible amount of freedom here for, him, for himself in which he could come and go. He could rest upon a person for a time, for a season, and then he could withdraw from a time. And so David was saying, I don't want, I don't want to do life apart from your Holy Spirit, God. I want your Holy Spirit within me at all times. Do not take it away. And so we see the Spirit working very clearly in the Old Testament. And then Jesus comes and, and he says, hey guys, I'm going to tell you some things now about the Spirit. Okay? And he starts teaching them in John 16. One of the things that we learn in the Old Testament or in the New Testament that's different than the Old was as the Spirit could go upon people and leave people, uh, not so in the New Testament. As we enter into the presence of God because of the work of Jesus Christ, we can have confidence in knowing that the Spirit's guidance is within us. The Spirit's guidance is there. Oh, yes, I can grieve the Spirit. Yes, I can insult the Spirit. I, I can invite His presence to be diminished in my life, uh, which I, it feels like, I, you know, where is God at in this? But, but He doesn't just come and go willy-nilly. He doesn't just come and touch someone for a time and then walk away from them. We, we have the confidence through the blood of Jesus of knowing that one of the gifts of His salvation is the Spirit's guidance in my life. And with that in mind, as we look at all this historical stuff, as we look at all these things about how the Spirit works and kind of understand a little bit better about who the Spirit is, one of the things, an uh, important fact that you cannot leave here without knowing is that the Holy Spirit has a heart for you. Don't walk away today having a good history lesson about the work of the Spirit in the Old Testament or through the people of Israel without knowing that the reason we have gathered today is to remind ourselves that the Holy Spirit has a heart for you. So it might be that you're dejected. It might be that you're worn out. It might be that you're experiencing life in a cruel and twisted way in which it's just beating you up and you're looking around saying, is there any hope 
that I can have? Is, does anyone care out there? Does anyone know what's going on? You need to walk away with confidence knowing that res- despite your feelings, despite what you're thinking, if you are a follower of Christ, I promise you what is being shared in the, in the Word of God that is a child of God, it brings the Spirit pleasure to influence you, to shape you, and to mold you. That's the truth right there. I don't care what you feel. You could sit here and argue with me and I would just point every day with incredible confidence that what you're coming at me with is stinking thinking and poor attitude and to get a better perspective and get into your word of God. Because I have confidence in knowing that God takes incredible pleasure in molding you and changing you from the inside out if you're a Christ follower. I know that from fact. I know that from his word. I know that from just 28 years, 28 plus years of experience of being a Christ follower. Oh oh my, longer than that, 32 years now. 32 years of being a Christ follower. Uh, I know that. I know that. Do you struggle with knowing what direction you should take in life? You know, you just so many options here and I just don't know. It just seems like a fog in front of me and I don't think there's a right way for me. Well, according to the Word of God, the Spirit guides you in the way to go. Psalm 143 verse 10 says, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good Spirit lead me on level ground. Do you feel like sin just has a stranglehold on your life? You're dealing with something for years. And today you say, God, I'm done with it. I'm tired of it. I lay it down. I'm never going to walk over there again. And by tonight's end, you're going to find yourself engaged in the exact same junk you said you were going to lay down just a few hours before that. And you're sitting there going, woe is me. How can I deal with this sin that, that is more powerful than me? Well, for you, I would say, Apply Romans 8.2 into your life. Claim it. Memorize it. And every time you're dealing with habitual sin and, and, and the power of sin, just put it in there. Put it in your life. Romans 8.2. Romans 8.2. Romans 8.2. Notice I'm not reading Romans 8.2 and you're not making a big deal about it. Why is that? Because I want you to go home and read it for yourself. You read it for yourself. Memorize it. Put it in a card. Deal with it. Reflect upon it on a regular basis, every time you're dealing with that stranglehold sin in your life. And just allow the Spirit to manifest itself in that area of your life. Oh, when we feel abandoned and alone in this world, the Spirit will remind us of our heavenly adoption. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 15, and 16, the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought you about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, which is a, a very familiar term, uh, literally daddy. You, know, you can claim that the heavenly father, the heavenly host of Israel is daddy to you. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. We live in a hopeless world, don't we? Ebola. Ebola could be here in Springfield, as far as I know, Matt. I don't. I hear CDC. I don't know. I don't know. Is the CDC trying to just keep us all from panicking? I don't know. Uh, ISIS. ISIS could be here too, as far as we know. They've probably been here for the last two years. I don't know. I'm going off script now. <laughs> I apologize. I'm going to have to apologize up front. It occurred to me on Tuesday. It occurred to me based on the demographics. I realize that this church, I'm sure, is just like the rest of our culture, and that is we're a split, divided culture. And so I'm sure on Tuesday, there were 40% of you that were hopeless because those horrible, terrible Republicans were coming into office and the world was going to be changed. And you know what I also realized? I realized that another 40% of the population on Wednesday were just as discouraged and hopeless as the first 40% because those horrible, terrible Republicans who got in promising they were going to change everything and this is going to get repealed and that was going to get repealed and this is going to get repealed, they were saying, hey, you know what? we got to get along. Let's get along. We're here for the long haul. And so then you're hopeless because you're sitting there going, I put you in for change and now there's no change. And so there's literally 80% of us that are hopeless because we put all of our stakes in the government. We put all our stakes in what politics could do for us. We put all our stakes in what other people could do to provide me hope for America. You know what? 
I, I have reason to be hopeless today with all the things I just named. All the things. And yet I abound with hope. Why is that? Because I am not putting my resources and putting my, or putting my faith into my personal resources. I'm not putting my faith and my hope into or my government. I'm not putting my faith into my hope, into my personal resources, into my checkbook. You know, I'm not putting it into my education. I'm not putting my hope into the military might that America has. Instead, I'm putting my hope. My hope is abounding because of the Spirit's active work within my life. And Paul encourages us in his letter to the Romans. And now, help me finish this, guys. Uh, the scripture says, May the God of what? Hope. You can do better than that. John was the only one that helped me here. May the God of what? Hope. Fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him. So that you may overflow with what? Hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit. And guys, this is something I lean into deeply now. Okay? Some, something I lean into deeply. Here's another thing that the Spirit does. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. We all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. So, so think about that for just a second. The, the Scripture's telling us to take unveiled faces, meaning take the masks off. Quit trying to approach God with your own power, with your own might, with your own sense of self-righteousness, and contemplate the glory of God. You see, that's really what church should be about right there, shouldn't it? That's when we meet together. That's what we should be doing. That's, that's time well spent when we contemplate the glory of God. A lot of times there's not change in a church. There's not change in life because we're so busy with pyrotechnics and we're so busy creating a show and an experience and we're trying to make it so that the, the, the hairs on the back of your neck and the hair on your arm goes up and you get a goose bump and you have this God feeling in, your, in, this, in the very moment. But then you walk away unchanged and you go, why is that? I just had a God moment. Why am I not unchanged? Why am I changed? Well, because a lot of times I think the church and I think we are guilty as American believers, uh, we don't come together and dwell upon the glory of God and just allow that to be imminent in our lives and so Paul says uh, uh, we all with unveiled faces we contemplate the Lord's glory we are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the spirit now again this is something I said this is a work that the Holy Spirit does, and I said, I really personally identify with that. Because I realize, I realize, there are some people here that don't like me. I get that. I get that. And you know what? I abound in hope in that area. Now, for those of you who are guests, don't think, don't think that you're like, what's going on here? No, no, I'm just saying, you know, what? you gather two or three hundred people together, I guarantee you the preacher, the preacher gets talked about every once in a while uh, at Sunday lunch. And you know, I get that. And you know, I'm okay with that. I understand that there's some of you out there that might say, you know, that Tony approaches things with too flippant an attitude sometimes. Or maybe someone says his leadership style just doesn't have the quite, quite the pizzazz that other people all across America have. He's no Andy Stanley. He's no Bill Hybels. You know? He's no fill-in-the-blank of whoever your self-help guru is that you watch on cable TV. You know? I get that. You know, maybe you just say, you know, I saw Tony a couple days ago kick a dog during a bad day. And, and I saw him do that. And, and he, he, he's just a bad person. I, I get that. I get that. And you know what? I, here's, I lean into this passage because the truth is this. Here's the good news. The Holy Spirit is in passionate pursuit to make me a better person. Now, I said this before, you know, five years ago, I'm a better person than I was five years ago. Why? Is it because I'm really working hard? No, it's because the Spirit's doing a work in me. And, and so what I tell you, if you don't like me very much, hey, hang around. Hang around a while. And you know what? The chances are, uh, in a couple of years, you're going to probably like me a little more because you're going to see the Spirit's work in me. And oh, by the way, because I've been preaching to myself this whole time, now I'll preach. Guess, guess what? There's a couple of you, if we're being honest, there's a couple of people out there I don't like so much either, <laughs> to be honest with you, uh, just being honest. But you know why I hang out with you and why I don't pick up the phone and say, hey, you know what, you probably need to find a different church to go to. Uh, let me give you 15 churches that are great. You know why I don't do that? 
Because I am confident that this verse applies to you as well. And so if we hang out together, as Jesus is doing a work in me, and Jesus is doing a work in you, then we're going to kind of see Jesus in one another. And I have hope that because of the Holy Spirit, that we're going to like one another one day. That's kind of what church tradition is about, guys. That's kind of why God calls us to be together. And it's so sad how we all fight, you know, again, Guest, I'm not. I'm talking about the church in general. I mean, I'm talking about the big C church from the last two thousand years. You know, we fight over color of carpet, over doctrine errors, and we split fellowship and we go away. And I contend that if we just hang out and just stay in it, you know, stay in it for a little bit longer, seeing the spirits working in our lives will cause us to love one another deeply. A preacher friend of mine called it prophetic love. And he said, "I love you not because of who you are, but because of who you will be." This is what he said about his congregation and his church. And, 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 and so that's the cool thing that the Spirit does. The Spirit is working to take away the religious jargon, take away the theological terms, just the rubber meets the road. The Spirit is working to make us better people. Isn't that cool? Well, evidently, I'm the only one who thinks that's cool, or you guys are just spellbound. I'm going to choose that you're spellbound, okay? Yeah, you see the arrogance now. I get it. I know, I know. The Holy Spirit's impassioned pursuit to make you a better person. And here's the key. In order for that to work, we have to yield ourselves to it. You, you see, the Spirit could be working, but if I'm not yielding, what will happen is I will grieve the Spirit, and He'll just pass over. He'll just pass over. His work will just pass over, and I won't experience the full effects of those works. So what's my responsibility uh, in this whole process? It's not me sitting here going, grow, Tony, grow, be better, be more mature. Quit telling the stupid jokes. Quit, in, quit putting your political spin on stuff. Quit doing all these things that offend people. Dress better. Iron your shirt more. Get a better haircut, Tony. You know, I, I don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. What I need to do is just say, God, I yield myself to you. Have your way in my life. And as you change me, let me embrace it. Let me embrace the change, God. Make me different from the inside out. And it might be right now that there's some people here that for you, the the process begins very beginning. The very first step of this whole yielding to the Holy Spirit comes at the point of salvation. It comes at the point where you recognize that who Jesus is is the real deal. You, You come to a point where you say, God, I need desperate forgiveness for my sins. I can't do this myself. And God, I, Jesus, I want you to come into my life, take possession of my life, and change me from the inside out. And I will follow you. I will be your disciple. I will be your child, God. That's that salvation experience. And that's really the first step of yielding to the Holy Spirit. But then what I've discovered is daily I yield, saying, God, have your way in my life. God, change me from the inside out. And I, it's a, just a decision. The salvation part is settled, but the, you know, Jesus kind of, and the Holy Spirit kind of chipping away at the, at the nicks and changing me, just the subtle, you know, the molding and all that. That's a day-by-day process that the theologians call sanctification. It happens every day as long as I'm above ground. As long as I'm drawing in oxygen, I'm being sanctified. And it doesn't conclude until I'm in the presence of God in eternity. And, and for the record, if it's going on with me, it's going on with you. I mean, that's what we all are dealing with here. And so the question I ask as we conclude today is just, what about you? What about you? Are there people in this room that you've never even started the process yet? You're just, you're investigating. You're, you're checking out the claims of Jesus. Well, would today be the day that you say yes to the Holy Spirit as he is talking to you, as he's imploring with you? And, and I also recognize there's a whole lot of Christ followers in here that, you know, you've overall said yes to the Holy Spirit's working, but there's still just that one thing in your life. Just that one thing, that one hurt that you're saying, God, okay, you came, you saved me, but I'm going to keep this here because it keeps me warm at night and I'm comfortable with this one thing. Is it that one hurt that you refuse to give up? Is it that one hang-up or that one habit that you have that you say, God, you can change everything about me, but I'm not giving up this one thing because for whatever reason, it's how I identify myself, it's who I am, it's what brings me comfort in this world, uh, it's what I put my hope in to some degree. I invite you today as we pray and as the band comes up in just a moment to just consider that and just maybe whisper a prayer to God saying, God, Is there something in my life that you can identify that I'm just clinging to? 
And you know what? If something comes to mind, it's not your guilt. It's not your id, ego, or super ego that's putting that in. It's, it's the Holy Spirit talking to you. And I would challenge you today to be willing to surrender it. Maybe the first time you've ever done that. Maybe the hundredth time. I don't know. But surrender it to God and say, God, I yield. Holy Spirit, I yield to you in this area. And I surrender it today. Knowing that I'm going to have to pray tomorrow and re-surrender it again tomorrow. Because I'm just going to naturally want to pick it back up. I'm just going to naturally want to take that back into my life again. And you just begin to have that conversation with the Spirit today. I'd invite you to do that. Let's, let's pray together right now. And as we settle our hearts, as we just kind of still our minds, no one's looking around. I, I'm the only one looking. I'm not going to point anyone out. I'm not going to embarrass anyone. But I just want to know that there's maybe someone else in the room with me that's dealing with this. If You're saying, yeah, Tony, I, I'm one of those two people. You, you, what you're describing is me. If that's you, you just, just let me know that you're out there. and I'll Because I'll, I want to pray for you in my mind. Okay, I see some hands. I see some hands up there, yeah. Thank you for identifying yourself. And, and Father, we come before you with confidence knowing that you sent your spirit into this world to do a work in us. Because you care about us, God. Because you know our names, Father. Uh, because you desperately love us so much where we're at that you're not willing to let us remain there. And so, Father, I pray for your spirit's work in our lives. God, would we be a church that yields to you quickly? And Father, would we be people that yield to you when your Spirit works in our lives? These things we pray in your Son's strong and powerful name. Amen. I invite you to stand to your feet. Join the band as they sing this song. If you need to talk to someone, Pastor John's over here. Christy's over here. I'll be in the back over here. Uh, over on the side, you can grab one of us, or maybe you just need to talk to God through prayer. You have that freedom as well. Let's sing.
Okay, hey, that song there is more than a song. Uh, hopefully for you and your life, it's a prayer. Uh, inviting Christ to reign into you, to be sent out to make a difference in this world, to make a difference in your families, to make a difference in your workplace. May that prayer happen uh, today before we leave. I uh, want you to know one thing. You know, we uh, uh, just, just an announcement just to let you know where we're at and, and changes and things like that in our life. Uh, we take leadership incredibly seriously uh, at Northbridge Church. You know, we don't just invite anyone to come up on the stage. I know taking one look at me, you'd go, really? Yeah, really. You know, I believe it. Uh, you know, Pastor Dave uh, was hanging around with us for, oh, golly, what, a decade, right? No, not that long. No, not that long. Uh, we just take leadership slowly. We watch people. We vet people. We want to make sure uh, their walk is what there is the same up here as it is in their life. And so one of the things I just want you to be aware of, we did this before GIC, but because of all the GIC stuff, we just wanted to keep things just focused. Uh, one of the things leadership did uh, at that time was invite Christy Love to be a part of our leadership team and to be on staff with us. And yeah, that deserves a clap. That's, that's definitely a, that's, you know, that's, hear me, and I hope, I hope your heart's the same as mine. I know Christy's on the same page. Christy and Bob are on the same page. That applause is not, yay, Christy, that applause is God. Thank you for doing a work in her life, doing a work in our lives, and bringing the two together. And so what Christy's doing is she's going to be on, on staff, uh, volunteer position, uh, because she just, you know, she's like, hey, I just see the need here, and I want to help and serve in this way. Uh, and, and, and specifically, the two key areas is going to be leadership development, and it's going to be helping new folks kind of get in and fit into the life of the church, uh, as far as how to serve, a place of significance, things like that. Both of those things are big tasks, big tasks uh, for who we are and where we're at at this stage of our development. So be praying for her as she brings people around her. Uh, be praying for yourself that maybe you know, you're meant to be a part of this and, and you're going to be a part of 
that of, of how, you know, the answer of how do we develop people and how do we develop leaders? How do we uh, help new followers grow deeper in Christ? How do we get new people uh, connected and plugged in and, and then released to serve the world around them? Uh, maybe that you're a part of that. So right now, let's just conclude today with praying for that. If you're near Christy, I invite you to just put a hand on her shoulder and uh, as she's leading that. we got some exciting things that will be coming up in the next few months. Uh, plans we're already rolling out. We'll talk more about it as those things get developed. So let's pray right now. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for how not just Christy and Bob and their family, but but just you know, I just nine years now of seeing how you call just tremendously neat, gifted, talented people to serve at Northbridge. Uh, God, whether they're serving in pastoral leadership, leadership on the on the first tier, or they're people just servant leaders, passing out bulletins and just greeting people and punching buttons. I am in awe, God, of the people, the quality of people that you bring here. And thank you for that. And so, Lord, we pray right now that we are yielded to your spirit to do your desire and your work uh, in the areas of leadership development, in the areas of helping people get fit in and, and they 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 become an owner of Northbridge and they get into the life of Northbridge just quickly, God. I just pray for those works to happen under your Spirit's influence. These things we pray in your Son's strong and powerful name. Amen. Hey, may you be blessed this week. Go in peace. You're dismissed. Have a great week, everyone.